Uh, we've talked a lot about resiliency and yes, as nurses, we need to be resilient. We need to care for ourselves because nobody else is going to take care of us but ourselves. But, you know, do we need resilient nurses? Yes. Do we need more nurses? Yes. But we also need to make sure that the nurses that we have are competent because that's really, you know, where the end game is when it comes to patient outcomes. How do economics, nursing, and healthcare intersect? And how can the profession break out of its tightly defined silo and have a greater impact as we move more deeply into the 21st century? Let's talk all about it with Dr. Kenneth Dion, president of Sigma Theta Ta International Honor Society of Nursing, right here on episode 379 of The Nurse Keith Show. So hey there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is all about you, your personal professional development, your career, and the healthcare system as a whole. And I'm here to share education, ideas, frequent diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people I can find out there in the worlds of healthcare, nursing, medicine, entrepreneurship, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride, and I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And if you'd like to help other people find the show, consider leaving a rating review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you happen to find the show. And consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Nurse Keith. It really helps support the show. And I appreciate all of you for doing your part. Please head over to nursekeith.com to find the show notes in the drop down menu marked podcasts. And today I am welcoming Kenneth Dion, PhD, MSN, MBA, the president of Sigma Theta Tau, which I'm sure all of you have heard of over the years during the course of your career. And Ken, it's really great to have you here. And the first thing I want to ask you is what is it about nursing being siloed where we don't necessarily interact with other professions around important topics like economics, technology, environmentalism. What what happens there and how can we start to remedy that? Well, first, Keith, let me say thanks for having me on the podcast. Really happy to be here. It's, uh, it's an honor. Um, you know, I think you bring up a really important point, whether it's within our own organizations uh, or within our profession, we do remain siloed sometimes. And I think we do that to ourselves. Um, there are a lot of issues that we're really passionate about uh, as a profession, and we talk amongst ourselves. Uh, we publish in nursing journals. We go to nursing conferences. But so often we don't talk with other professions who may share the interest that we have in a particular topic. Take, say, conservation as an example. You know, there are a whole group of engineers who are passionate about both the healthcare profession and how we design the way we do work. And these are also people who share our passion for what's going on with our planet. But we don't talk to these folks all that much, you know? And I've been really fortunate over the last few months of uh, having the opportunity to publish with a colleague who's an engineer. And it's been really, really enlightening. But the important piece to your question is, why don't we do that more often? And I think a part of it is our fear of speaking in languages that may not be our day-to-day language as a profession. You know, we're comfortable talking uh, about things that are within the domain of nursing. But we don't really talk about economics or technology or conservation all that much. Conservation, certainly entering the dialogue more um, because of healthcare's impact on the environment. Um, but we certainly don't sit down and talk to engineers all that much about, you know, how the units we work in are designed, uh, how the technologies we work with are designed and implemented. So I think we really have to work hard as a profession to expand our vocabulary and our fluency 
in other domains outside of healthcare to be able to engage with other professions who are definitely interested in engaging with us? Mm -hmm. Great question. Well said. Yeah. We do have organizations like the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments who are getting involved in those conversations and really putting themselves out there. But I appreciate that Sigma specifically as an organization is seeing that this needs to change. And you told me before we started uh, recording that Sigma is entering or has entered their second 100 years, right? And they are looking at this notion of nurses needing to be bolder and to share their passions more widely. And when you said a couple minutes ago about nurses not being comfortable talking about things that are, you know, quote unquote, like outside the domain of nursing, maybe it's part of this is redefining what's in the domain of nursing. Maybe everything is in the domain of nursing. You know, you bring up a really good point. You know, uh, I'm sure there are philosophers who could talk for hours about the boundaries of the domain of nursing. But I would say that, you know, when it comes to healthcare, there is no profession who understands healthcare better from the bench to the bedside to the boardroom than the nursing profession. Um, nursing makes up 50% of the healthcare workforce around the globe. And yet so often we're not at the table and we hear that and there's no reason we can't be at the table. People want our opinions about things. And I think in some cases we need to be a little bit more willing to offer them. I think as a profession, sometimes we don't take credit for the work that we do. And to your point, the domain of nursing is very broad and people outside the profession don't understand the breadth of things that nurses actually do, that we're scientists and that we're entrepreneurs. Now, this is how I became about really passionate about nursing entrepreneurship, you know, was trying to help nurses you know, take credit and, and make sure that the intellectual property that they create is protected because it's really valuable. A lot of times it's in the domain of what's referred to as intangible intellectual property. We create protocols and other things that it's not the next new drug or the next new device, but that's not to say it's not incredibly valuable, but we have to be willing to take credit for doing that work and get with the right people to help us protect that work that we've created. And also in the process of doing that, again, explain to the public what nursing does, because as being the most trusted profession, could 5 million nurses in the United States uh, get on a legislator's agenda? Sure. But if 5 million nurses could mobilize even half the people in the United States, because there are so many things that no matter which side of the aisle on, we all truly care about many of the same things. If those things, if nurses really, you know, put shoulder to the wheel and got the public engaged as the most trusted profession because they understand what we do, um, we could probably move some mountains anyway. Um, again, great question, but uh, uh, something that I'm passionate about, as you can tell. I can totally tell. And you mentioned apropos of, you know, sharing with other professions, you know, kind of creating alliances and moving beyond what we might see as the quote unquote, you know, boundaries of nursing and nursing thought, nursing theory, nursing practice. You said you're writing articles, co-writing articles with an engineer. And my assumption here is that you're writing them for the journal Nursing Economics. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. Yes. Nur nursing Economics has been um, a great supporter over the years. Um, fantastic publication has done a great deal to support the nursing profession, both nursing economics and uh, Anthony Gennetti, the organization uh, that's the publisher behind nursing economics. Uh, I think it's been fantastic for me to have that as a go-to journal uh, over my career, uh, having had an interest in both business and healthcare. Uh, 
really has done a lot also to support nursing scholars uh, in terms of the work that uh, nurses are doing in the area of economics, uh, an area that nurses really need to be fluent in. But so often nurses default to thinking about economics as being finance. And finance is really just a component of economics. And that's a really, really important point to make. Now, economics is the science of decision making, really, and how power can influence decision making. And in that regard, finance is a vehicle for power, right? Money is just a vehicle for power or something that we trade uh, in a transaction. So there are a lot of other vehicles for power or vehicles that influence decisions, right? One of those is trust, right? We purchase things from people that we trust. We interact with people that we trust. So again, nursing being the most trusted profession has not taken the opportunity to interact with the public in a manner to really do something with that trust other than getting that annual recognition. Mm -hmm. Now, there are so many places where nurses are truly involved in policy and in decision making and the ability to influence decisions that we should be using that trust, which is a something that is valuable, even though it's that intangible, to use that economic term again, but something that does have value. And I think the more that we can articulate the value of the nursing profession within the healthcare systems, the more likely that we're going to be able to influence positive change as a profession in healthcare systems. Mm, well said. So influencing positive change and having, let's say, a hand in the conversation about decision-making. You said a lot of economics has to do with decision-making. So I would think that it could do with healthcare management, best practices, policy, right? All of those different pieces. And some nurses listening might hear the words nursing and economics, and they, like, they don't even associate the two. And you also mentioned they might just default to thinking about finance, like, oh, it's about, you know, paying bills and, and staffing. Well, staffing is actually a huge economic issue, isn't it? Oh, there's no doubt that staffing is a huge economic issue. Uh, you know, I would love uh, for us to reframe the conversation when it comes to nurse staffing uh, to not talk about nursing as a cost center, but mm -hmm. as a value center, because we provide so much value within the healthcare systems. But it's hard to articulate all the things that nurses do. You know, I, I even remember in my earliest days of nursing, my nursing instructors talking about, well, the reason that you give a bath is because it gives you the opportunity to do a good assessment on the patient on so many different domains, whether it's the integrity of the skin or whether it's their mentation, right? And these are all things that, again, those intangibles that nurses do that are incredibly valuable. And so, I think nurses add value. We need to think about nursing in the value added frame of mind. Think about how many untoward things would happen in a hospital or a healthcare system if there weren't nursing professionals there to watch out for those sentinel events. Uh, I think it's a very important part. I, I think that nurses being involved in the designing of systems, whether those be, you know, physical or process systems is incredibly important. Nurses need to be involved in the conversations from the design to the selection to the implementation. Whether it's looking at a technology, nurses need to be working with the technology vendors um, rather than engineers deciding what nurses use uh, because engineers know best because they've walked in a nurse's shoes. I think not. Not to say I don't love my engineer colleagues. I've already said that. I do. We have to collaborate. That's just the point. And we're going to have a better product. And then nurses need to be involved in the selection of the tools that they're going to work with. And then ultimately how those tools are going to be implemented. And that's 
a lot of work that nurses aren't involved in all the time, um, but we should be. And it's going to impact our healthcare system and determine whether the technologies and innovations that we use are going to make our work um, more productive. And I'm going to use the word more pleasurable so that we're doing what we went to school to do, deliver great patient care and the technology be a tool in our toolkit to do exactly that and not something that's burdensome and takes us away from what we were trained to do as nurses. Right. And for pleasurable, we might substitute the word satisfying or gratifying or whatever it happens to be that we get out of our work. And in terms of this intersection of economics, staffing, nursing, healthcare, I want to point you and also listeners back to episode 372. This is um, seven episodes prior with Robert Wingo, a nurse informaticist who I actually need to in, uh, introduce you to, who has identified some errors, classic errors that have been ongoing and passed from generation to generation in terms of how staffing is calculated. He's kind of found this error that he's trying to call out for people to notice in terms of nurse staffing. So there are some people out there thinking really deeply, nurses especially, thinking deeply about how we can innovate. And Robert's one of those people. And I look forward to the two of you meeting. And Let's just talk a little bit for a moment about your your history, Ken. You you have a PhD and an MSN. You also have an MBA. And I've known other nurses who have garnered MBAs along the way, or maybe before becoming nurses. How do you find the MBA and you know advanced degrees or terminal degrees in nursing? How do they work together? What's that marriage like? Another very good question. So I did mine as actually a joint MSN MBA. I, oh. you know, particularly sought out a program where I could combine both both master's degrees at the same time. Uh, it was a rigorous program. I really enjoyed it. Um, I will say, you know, certainly it exposed me to a variety of things that I had not thought about entering the program when I started the program. My goal was to put the best tools in my toolkit to be the best um, leader of uh, an emergency department that had ever walked the face of the earth. Now, I knew that that was an unrealistic goal, but you get what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Really, that was that I thought was going to be my career goal. And through being exposed and back to our earlier conversation uh, to other professions and other disciplines. Um, so many different doors open. Uh, I got involved in some extracurricular activities where I got involved in both the Entrepreneurship Society and the Consulting Society, uh, which led me to do a summer internship in informatics. I'd always had an interest in technology, but um, really had never seen myself marrying um, my interest in technology with my healthcare background. And so after that internship, I had like two semesters left in school. I wound up really focusing in informatics and going to work for the firm I had internshiped with uh, for a couple of years and going down the nursing informatics route, hmm. um, which uh, again, I think it was the exposure to all of the different disciplines that I met in business school, because I had people who were engineers, people who were pure business students, um, you know, people who came from a variety of different backgrounds to get their MBAs, uh, all that exposure really piqued my interest in nurse entrepreneurship. So after spending some time in the informatics world, I uh, saw an opportunity uh, that wasn't being met in healthcare informatics wound up going down the entrepreneurship route. So I would say that um, the MBA, not only did it put valuable tools in my toolkit that I would use every day, you know, whether I'm going to 
lease or buy a Pixis machine for my organization or whether I'm going to lease or buy a car. It's the exact same calculation, right? So you get this multifold benefit of doing the MBA. So there's the tool in the toolkit. There's also the different things that you will be exposed to, which may, may reframe your thinking about a variety of different things. And at the very least, you'll be exposed to a lot of really interesting people who will probably be your friends for the rest of your life, like some of my friends from my MBA uh, time. That's great. And and I understand that your your MSN, your MBA, and your doctorate in nursing systems were all from University of Texas at Austin, right? Yes, that's yeah. correct. So you did all those degrees at UT. And I just wanted to go back for a second because you said you, you delved into you know the entrepreneurial space. And from your bio, I, I understand that in 1999, right before the turn of the millennium, you founded a cloud-based information systems company, and that was called Decision Critical Inc. And you were awarded a patent for something called Critical Portfolio. It was an e-portfolio application and Critical Staffer, a reverse staffing system. And tell us about what was it like to to move into that, you know, cloud-based kind of software world from the perspective of a nurse? What was what was that experience like and how was that intersection, you know, with the wider healthcare healthcare ecosystem? Uh it was an interesting transition. Like I said, I had always had interest in technology. Um mm-hmm. I really didn't see myself starting a software company, but um, again, based on my nursing background, um, nursing model, uh, the synergy model, in short, says nurse has a group of characteristics, patient has a group of characteristics. If you match those characteristics, you're going to optimize the patient outcome. No brainer for any nurse listening to the call today. Um, And so... I realized that we had all of this data about our patients with the advent of the electronic health record, which at that point in time in 1999, we were actually calling a clinical data repository because we were taking Hmm. the data from all of these systems, putting them into one database, and then offering the end user kind of an integrated look at all of this data. That was the early days of the EHR or EMR or whichever acronym we're using today. Um, But I knew that all of the data about the providers was scattered throughout the organization in managers' files and things like that, and that you know people would just cringe when you would hear Jacob was coming because it was like, oh, they were going to want you know the fire safety report, and that meant every manager going through their files. I thought, well, if we could find a way to deliver and centralize the data around that education, that would be of value to the organization. And so ultimately, over time, we built upon that foundation of what we refer to today as a learning management system, which was the product we built back in 99. We expanded that to include skills checklists or behavioral evaluations, performance evaluation, and then ultimately to give the end user the ability to add to that data um, through their own portal, if you will. So it was really their entire portfolio of all of their professional development activities, not just what they did at their employer, but you know they could include um, letters from family. Now, all of those things that would give you really that 360 degree view of a nurse as a professional, not just that two dimensional view, because we were of the mindset and I remain of the mindset and passionate about it to today is that, you know, it's competent care that moves the needle on patient outcomes. You know, we all can be compliant and do our fire safety and do the things we're required to do for our jobs. But that's not what's going to move the needle on patient care. It's in those other things that, again, we're back to the intangibles that are the beauty of nursing, you know, the empathy that we show, the things that we do that are outside of being compliant that really move the patient outcomes needle. Hmm. I love how you made that leap from talking about founding a software company 
and you came around to the role of empathy in patient care. I love that because that shows the ways in which you bridge those worlds. And you just did it conversationally, naturally, organically, without even thinking about it, because that's the way your mind works because you've you've walked in all of these different worlds. And I really appreciate that. And when we come back from the break, I want to talk a little bit about your work with other organizations like the National Student Nurse Association, Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, and some of your visions for the re, let's say the remainder of the 21st century when it comes to nursing. So are you are you willing and able to put on your futurist hat when we come back from the break? Looking forward to it. All right. Looking forward to the future. Okay. So stick with us and we will be right back for the second half of episode 379 of the Nurse Keith Show with Ken Dion, president of Sigma Theta Tau. Hey, everyone. Let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? Thanks for being a valued listener of The Nurse Keith Show, and if you'd like to help other people find the podcast, please consider leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. This really helps propel the show and grow our audience, and I truly appreciate everyone who's already taken the time. And if leaving a public rating review isn't your thing, why not tell a colleague about The Nurse Keith Show by sending them a link so they can listen for themselves. After all, word of mouth is the most organic way for me to reach those who truly need to tune in. So if you'd like to do me a solid, please consider leaving a rating review or telling a friend or colleague. And by doing so, you'll be helping the Nurse Keith Show reach more and more nurses and healthcare professionals all around the world. Now, let's get back to today's conversation. And we're back. Welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with friend of the pod and my new friend, Ken Dion, president of Sigma Theta Tau. And Ken, prior to the break, we were talking about, well, pretty much everything under the sun, especially right before the break, we were talking about you delving into worlds of software and and online cloud-based systems in 1999, right before the turn of the millennium. And I asked you if you're willing to put on your futurist hat and you are wearing it. And I appreciate you being willing. So here we are, 2022. We're 22 years into the new millennium, the new century. You got into that work in 1999, right on the cusp of it all. And nursing is, I find, still trying to find its way, still trying to find its voice and its place. You know, we, we know what we do well. And like you said, you know, there are ways in which we could interact with other professions and other schools of thought and kind of put our feelings and our thoughts out there in the world and share them and move beyond this place of this silo we often find ourselves in. When you look forward at the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years, especially as president of Sigma as well, what do you foresee and what would you like to see nurses do beyond what we've already said? What can the profession do to break out of the kind of the shackles we've worn? Big long pause. Yes. For a big question. Mm. Well, maybe start with throwing away the box. Okay. I think doing things because it's always been thus is not going to help us. And that's, you know, why, as it relates to Sigma, the call to action around being bold is, you know, based in being fluent in these other domains of dialogue. Um, because it's going to be incredibly important to be able to speak these other languages, to be able to have influence. Doing the same thing, we know the definition of insanity, quote, so I won't go there. Mm -hmm. Um, We we really, you know, have to shake it up. As I alluded in the first half of the podcast, 
you know, us being involved in every step of the process, no matter what that process is, because if we do not retain the role of nursing in a very different future of healthcare, uh, other people will prescribe to nursing, but yet again, what nursing's role is. And I don't think it's what it has been. I mean, it is going to require so much innovation to deal with the future ahead of us in healthcare. And we can be as myopic as we want and look at just our own organization and how much has to change within our organization, or we can look at things on a global scale. I mean, you know, there are entire populations that are migrating because of what's happening to the planet, and that impacts the nursing profession. It impacts where the nurses where those people are migrating to, and also those nurses who are left behind to take care of the people who are left in those places that are devastated by things that uh, we need to put a curb on. And our individual actions as practitioners, as well as what we do as global advocates for human beings, because mm -hmm. that it, isn't that the central role of the nursing profession mm -hmm. at its essence is to be advocates for human beings. So that, back to your earlier point, nurses play along the entire continuum, and we have to be involved in all of these conversations. Mm -hmm. So putting on my future hat, uh, you know, I hope it's a, a lot brighter than some of the things that we're seeing in the media all the time. And it can be if we're willing to be actively involved. I think that's being involved in your professional organization, whether that's Sigma Theta Ta or any other professional organization that suits you. Uh, I think that that's really important. And I think keeping up with technology, you know, what does the future look like? It looks like one where either nurses were engaged in the decision making of what the technology looks like or not. Take, for example, just very quickly, you know, the electronic medical records we work with today, um, not the most user friendly. Um, and not only that, but there's also the way that they're oriented in that we've lost the nursing narrative in so many of the EHRs today. And where's the Can real balance? Well, so we, yes, thank you for the clarifying question. Yeah. So, so much of what you will find in electronic health record will be check boxes. Uh, and I remember having a conversation one time when we were actually developing some screens back in early days of electronic health records, and they wanted a whole lot of boxes that said uh, WNL within normal limits. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that might work in other places, but in America, that stands for we never looked, uh, according to the attorneys. Oh. Just, just a little <laughs> change there. I get but it. I get let, it. Let's just say a lot of the narrative has gone away out oh. of the electronic health record. So we don't have the, the subjective narrative of the nurse. We just have, exactly. we have data points. Exactly. We have data points. Okay. But there is actually so much data in that subjective narrative about the patient. And it's not until recently with the advent of artificial intelligence and the ability of algorithms to scan through big data, we're beginning to see patterns in narrative data, right? That's how your computer can now finish a sentence for you as you're typing an email, or at least make a suggestion, mm -hmm. right? That's artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. They say AI is coming. It's around us all the time. If you use Siri or yeah. any of these other things, AI is in your back pocket. Um, so we're going to see a lot more AI in healthcare, and it can be a great tool to us. Um, and so just as an example, seeing a future where we've got a narrative electronic health record, you know, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, again, that's going to put incredible value on the nursing profession, or there can be a tr incredible value attributed to the nursing profession as the gatekeepers of that data. And let me take this thought mm -hmm. just a little bit further. 
in okay. that so data and algorithms are both captured and written by human beings so if there is bias for now, for okay. now but and 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 but you bring up a very good point for now so eventually the algorithms will be learning from the algorithms we've heard that from all of the people who know much more about this than i the only okay. point i wanted to make is if there is bias entered either in the collection of the data or the writing of the algorithm, then that bias is going to perpetuate and potentially potentiate itself. But uh, th when we look at both the collection of the data and the processing of the data, if there is bias in either parts of that, then that's just going to replicate exponentially as that algorithm words for it itself. So nurses are going to be vital in both the data collection and also the development of the algorithms and tools that will be using the algorithms that will be using the data. Because if we're not the stewards of that data, once again, who is going to be watching out for these populations? Boy, went a little bit oh deep there. Gosh. I'm sorry about that. But when no, you ask good. me what the future looks like, we have a big role in technology in the future and technology is going to have a big role in our practice and it, either we're actively involved in the development and implementation of it or we're slaves to it that's true that's true and no it's not too deep and my first response is oh what a tangled web we weave first of all when it comes to ai healthcare etc you know just you can finish <laughs> that sentence but i want to I want to track this slightly differently now, looking at the future. So you were the inaugural assistant dean for business innovation and strategic relationships at Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. And so you have an inside view of nursing education. You've also been all the way through a terminal degree within nursing education. So you understand that entire process from the bachelor's degree all the way through to a PhD. So my question is, how do I frame this? I've talked about this on the show before with other guests. In nursing school, especially associate and bachelor's level, we're, we're teaching to the NCLEX, right? So we're teaching about the things that nurses, nursing students need to know in order to pass the NCLEX so they could become licensed. Certain things, from my perspective, get short shrift during the course of education because they're not necessarily going to be covered on the exam. And one of my concerns for the future vis-a-vis -vis nursing education is how do we make sure that these notions of the intersection of technology and nursing and healthcare, the importance of this gets transmitted to students when it's not really part of like the NCLEX world. So professors don't have neither time or energy to devote to them. How do we fix that? Or do you think it's even a problem? Can I answer this question in the frame of the last question? So 30 years from now in a perfect world, yeah. Well, I will tell you that, again, this goes back to kind of a theme that I've had throughout our conversation, and it's about that intangible piece, mm -hmm. you know, um, working through a terminal degree. You know, they talk to you about the different levels of data and how as you have a higher level of data, the better quality that you're going to have. or Conversely, one could say you've also maybe created greater shades of gray as well. And I would say as a profession, we do have a bad habit of maybe creating more shades of gray for ourselves than we need to. I don't know how we move from that model of compliance to competency-based education in a very skillful manner. There's going to be some trial and error, but I think it's something that we're capable of doing. I'm hopeful. Uh, it's something that I've always been passionate about, you know, and we know that NCLEX, it's, you know, a compliance 
activity. When I was involved with the National Student Nurses Association, both mm-hmm. as a student uh, and then later on, later on, I had the privilege of uh, talking to the students and I would always ask that question. Who's got that student in their class who makes 100 on every exam that you wouldn't let touch you in a clinical setting? And every hand in the room goes up. And I said, and that is the difference, my friends, between compliance and competency, right? Oh, I love that. Okay, got it. And, and but that's that's the difference. And and how do we demonstrate that? And so that was what was behind the portfolio that we find a different vehicle to capture what I talk about as the artifacts of the art of nursing. And as long as I'm on my soapbox and she's given me a couple of seconds, I'll say my other thing is can along those lines, can we switch around the art and science of nursing? It's actually the science and art of nursing, right? We learn the science in nursing school and it's through the practice that we actually evolve to practicing the art of nursing. And so that's mm-hmm. what we have to get to. How do we capture that essence, that art of nursing? And I know we're not there yet. But I think we're moving in that direction. We're going to scrape our knees a little bit along the way, but we'll get there. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, you know, that's what we're going to need. You know, um, we've gone through some really difficult times. Uh, we've talked a lot about resiliency. And yes, as nurses, we need to be resilient. We need to care for ourselves because nobody else is going to take care of us but ourselves. But, you know, do we need resilient nurses? Yes. Do we need more nurses? Yes, but we also need to make sure that the nurses that we have are competent because that's really, you know, where the end game is when it comes to patient outcomes. That's true. And then we need nurse futurists. We need nurse economists. We need um, nurse lawyers. We need nurses in Congress. I've talked about this on the show. We need nurses who are mayors, they're on the school board, you know, whatever it happens to be, we need nurses to infiltrate and, and, and have have some sort of um, influence over different aspects of society because you and I identified early in our conversation that nursing intersects with much more than we would naturally think in terms of the society. And I want to ask you, in terms of sigma, because we have to go soon, unfortunately, what can nurses take advantage of? when it comes to Sigma Theta Ta and what the organization offers. If I'm a nurse who's interested and just wants to understand what Sigma does, how can I, as a rank and file staff nurse out there in the world, interface with Sigma? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. And thanks for that question. Um, so Sigma, uh, one of the oldest nursing organizations in the world, you know, founded on nursing scholarship and nursing leadership. Um, that's where we do the majority of our work, uh, both here in the United States and around the globe. Um, we have offerings that are for any nurse. You don't have to be a member of Sigma. I had a great series of podcasts on resiliency. It's one example uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. Um, whole offering for rank and file staff nurse, especially for new nurse graduates. We have a whole series on surviving your first year in nursing. Uh, in terms of leadership, variety of both, you know, offerings, books, podcasts, all of the typical things, but really, really great conferences on leadership. Uh, in particular, healthy work environment is uh, something that uh, we're really concerned about as an organization. You know, uh, we lost a lot of nurses uh, during the pandemic who have gone on to other professions and and maybe have left a moment for those who uh, have left us as part of the work they were doing. Thank them for all the work that they did during the pandemic. Um, but there's a lot of things that Sigma has to offer for both folks who are interested in academia. There are a whole cadre of folks uh, who it, you would just bond with immediately, as well as people in the clinical space. Um, Sigma's doing a lot of work uh, with healthy work environment in the clinical space, uh, partnering with a variety of different organizations. So 
I like to think of Sigma as kind of my home base as a professional organization. I may traverse through a variety of different things throughout my career. I started off as an emergency department nurse originally, wound up going informatics, wound up going into entrepreneurship, and then uh, academia after that. I mean, boy, talk about a, a pitch for the nursing profession. Look at that. I had four completely separate, different careers without changing professions, beauty of the profession. And throughout all of that, even though I was involved uh, in the Emergency Nurses Association and the Informatics Nurses Association, I always had Sigma's kind of home base to go to where I could always connect with people who shared my interests at that point in time. And so I would encourage people to whether it be Sigma or whatever professional organization it is for you that's right, to get involved in your professional organization. You know, I know there are those folks who it's good to put it on your resume and you pay your dues every year, but you really reap the benefit when you get involved in your professional organization. We'd love to have you as a Sigma member. There are lots of med- member benefits, uh, but also just, uh, you know, get actively involved in your professional organization for all of the reasons we talked about, you know, influencing policy and, you know, ultimately uh, being the steward of your own profession. That starts with being involved in your professional organization. It's a good pitch, Ken. Really good one. And um, speaking of benefits, I also want to rec- recommend or mention that you write for Nursing Economics, the journal. And I saw that the Nursing Economics Foundation has four $5,000 annual scholarships awarded to nurses in either master's or doctoral programs with an emphasis on administration or management. Is that active every year? And can people apply for those year round for the following school year? Yes, that is my understanding. Uh, you know, I would defer on the specific details, time frame, uh, application process uh, to my colleagues at Nursing Economics. But yes, uh, really valuable opportunity. And uh, I know uh, my nurse scholar colleagues can make $5,000 go a really long way. And I've seen great work come out of that. So uh, I first of all, would like to thank Nursing Economics uh, for their support of the nursing profession. Also, the opportunity for uh, myself and my colleague, Dan Odier, uh, to author a column for them uh, around uh, nursing uh, financial literacy. We think it's really important that nurses be financially literate, just one part of being economically savvy. So yes, and I would encourage uh, all of your listeners, uh, if they're interested, to take advantage of that scholarship opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. And before we go, I have four quick questions I ask every guest, and they're not really related to what we were just talking about, but they could be. So are you game for four quick questions? We'll see if I can come up with four quick answers. All right. This is the lightning round. Okay. So how do you define success personally or professionally? Well, I think about what it's going to say on my tombstone at the end of my life. And I've got two out of the three bullet points because I think in bullet points down. Uh, One, uh, he created. uh, Two, he never said he wished he had. And three, I'm glad I still have time to work on the third one. That's really good. (laughs) I recently saw an article in the New York Times showing that a lot of people put favorite recipes on their tombstone so that they can be passed down. (laughs) just saying. Um, I'll have to think of a recipe for mine. Um, now, how would you describe one person who's inspired you in the course of your life, living or dead, famous or not? That they lived their beliefs every day. I mean, you know, that's a really hard thing to do. Mm. It really is. I mean, if you think about it, um, it's just a tough world we live in and, uh, you know, easy to compromise sometimes. And, you know, if you can be a person that lives their positive beliefs every day, uh, that's a good role model. Hmm. It sounds like you're one of those people, Ken. <laughs> so next question. Is there a book or a movie? It doesn't have to be an absolute favorite, just one that comes to mind that's had an impact on the way you think or the way you live. 
And again, it doesn't have to be a favorite, just, just one that, you know, just has had some impact. Um, yeah, uh, a book that my wife and I read to each other on a trip when we were first dating, hmm. um, before we got married and she couldn't find a trip, uh, a book for the trip. And so we wound up sharing one. Uh, and it was the five people that you meet in heaven by Mitch Allen. Oh yes. Wow. And you all read that aloud? Allowed to each other. That's really lovely. The five people you meet in heaven by by Mitch album, right? Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. My my fiance and I have the habit now, the practice of reading books aloud. It's really fun. It it's a really lovely thing we do together. So all right, last thing. What's a piece of advice you would give 18-year-old Ken right now, whether you think he would listen or not. What would you tell Ken right now? <laughs> uh, again, quoting someone nearest and dearest to me, Ken, it's all going to be okay in spite of you. All right. That's a good one. Maybe he would listen to that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, lots of, lots of planning. Uh, but you know what? And And, you know, I guess that's the piece of advice that I would give everyone we you know best laid plans but uh we all got to keep moving forward and so uh yeah yeah well ken thank you so much this has been so wonderful i've kept you on the mic a long time and i really appreciate your time and insights and brilliance it's been really fun pleasure it's been mine thanks for letting me spend time with you well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Nurse Keith Show with Ken Dion, president of Sigma Theta Ta. Remember to look for the show notes at nursekeith.com. I hope you feel uplifted and empowered from this episode. And if you need personalized holistic career coaching, think about heading over to nursekeith.com. Mention the show or Ken or Sigma Theta Ta and get 10% off your first coaching package. And if you want to become a patron, at patreon.com, head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith and consider becoming a monthly patron. The Nurse Keith Show is a proud member of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We are jointly produced by the amazing Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting and Mark Cappy Spiesen is our awesome and stalwart social media ringmaster and newsletter wrangler. Before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with a quote that I love by the musician Robert Fripp. May my living honor my parents. May my living repay the debt of my existence. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Ken Dion, president of Sigma Theta Ta, saying Arrivederci from? Breckenridge, Colorado. Breckenridge, Colorado. Thank you, Ken. Thanks to everyone for listening, and we will catch you all on the proverbial flip side.